Hello and welcome to Glasgow Truth Group Radio. It is the 11th of February 2013 and I hope you had a nice Christmas and New Year wherever you happen to be. Today I'll be speaking to Tom Secker of InvestigatingTheTerror.com who is the filmmaker behind the documentaries 77 Seeds of Deconstruction and 77 Crime and Prejudice. We'll be talking about the connections between Hollywood, the military intelligence complex and the alternative media in what we hope will be a continuing series of interviews to explore the genesis of ideas within the truth media and the way in which these institutions have shaped and influenced our culture at large. Okay, so hi Tom and um, thanks for um, thanks for joining me today. It's great to have you on the show. Um, I thought probably the best place to, to kick off um, our, our talk today was just to give the, the listeners a little bit of background on where you've come from in your research, um, because as I mentioned in the intro, um, 77 um, has been your primary interest um, and primary area of research. And um, I, I think um, it would be good if you could sort of talk a little bit about how your journey into this material and your research has differed from the sort of um, shall we say, the, the, the mainstream conspiracy narrative and, and many of the more popular theories about what happened on 7-7. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I suppose what's, what's fundamentally different in my experience of all of this compared to a lot of people is the order in which things happened. Um, I come from a kind of, if you like, a hippie background, and therefore, I've spent I spent my childhood and, and my teenage years around protest movements and radical movements of all sorts of different kinds, really. Mostly a sort of hippie, anti-nuclear, eco-activists, that kind of group. But just in general, I I was never brought up to think that you should trust what governments say, uh, that major events just happen. Um, that, oh, I don't know, that any of the sort of normal beliefs that a lot of people would have had, say, before they got into the subject of 9-11, I never believed any of that to begin with. So I never had the, what people refer to as a kind of waking up. Um, I never had a, a sort of, I never had to go through that process, because if you like, I was already in a mental space due to my upbringing and due to my experiences um, where I could think about these things straight away. So just to take an example, on the morning of 9-11, when the news came in about Flight 93 in Shanksville, Uh and a lot of people, I think a lot of people's reaction was they've shot it down. Um, It's rather obvious that the Air Force have somehow got to this plane and shot it down. And even some of the news coverage was suggesting this. And I was one of those people who I was was discussing this with members of my family who I was watching this with on television. And I was saying, well, why, you know, why, why didn't they get to the other planes and shoot them down? I was already thinking along those kinds of lines. And I'm not saying this to say, you know, look at me, I was great. I was already thinking about this straight away. Plenty of other people were as well. But what it meant was when two or three years down the line you started to get a big movement around this you started to get a big online discussion about this i it never shocked me i never went through that kind of like i say the waking up process that people refer to where they undergo some kind of emotional shift Mm -hmm. and they start to think cripes what if the government was behind this? What what else might they be up to? Or if not the government, whatever kind of nefarious, secretive organisation you might think really was behind 9-11. Um, so that didn't have the same kind of impact on me as it had on a lot of other people of, if you like, severely disrupting their worldview. And a lot of people who are now part of the truth movement, part of the alternative web-based media, whatever, came from a more, if you like, a more conservative place. I didn't. I never, you know, I was never remotely sort of normal or conservative, if you like, to begin with. Um, so when 7-7 happened, I I was in much of the, much the same kind of situation that I didn't, I, I've never believed the official story. 
Um, but I didn't in any way feel obliged to, I suppose, subsume 7-7 under my worldview. A lot of people did. A lot of people thought, because I believe 9-11 was an inside job or whatever tag you want to put on it, uh, because I think 9-11 was a false flag, I therefore automatically believe that 7-7 must be a false flag and that it must have gone down in a relatively similar way. And this is particularly the case with the whole exercise, false flag exercise drill gone live idea. Because mm-hmm. um, with 9-11, I can totally see where people are coming from with that. Because you've got the very agency, NORAD, who would most be implicated in trying to stop this sort of attack, uh, <laughs> being involved in a whole series of overlapping exercises and war games and what have you that simulated and replicated various different aspects of this attack. So if there were, if there was some kind of slowdown or stand down or a, at least a deliberate greying and, and muddying of the information so that that could facilitate the attacks, that could p- create the holes in the defence that in, allowed the, ta- the attack to happen. I can completely understand that scenario. I think it's, a, it's plausible, I think it's reasonably well evidenced. I'm not saying it's strictly true, because I don't know, but I can totally see where people are coming from with that. <clears throat> On 7-7, it's a bit different, because th- there's, no, um, there's no equivalent. It's not like these were four suicide bombers who got to London, phoned up the police and said, we're going to blow ourselves up in 45 minutes, you've got 45 minutes to track, and da- track us down and shoot us, and while that was all going on, the police were actually running an exercise where they were trying to sh- track down suicide bombers. It's not like that was actually going on in London. What we actually had was a small, or at least according to media interviews, we had a small private management consultancy agency running a tiny little private exercise that they have that agency, that uh, that government, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That company, that consultancy, didn't have any responsibility for stopping the attacks in the way that NORAD did have a responsibility for trying to stop the attacks of 9-11. So the two aren't a parallel. They aren't, it isn't the same situation at all, really. So I never felt obliged. I never felt really all that. I never hung very much on this, this 7-7 exercise. I never hung very much on Peter Power as a suspect. I never really felt that was where the, the truth about 7-7 lay and that that was a kind of important clue to figuring this whole thing out. Whereas on 9-11, I think the exercises, in particular the NORAD exercises, are very important. And so I think the the two scenarios, the two situations, are quite different. And I suppose in that, I I differ from a lot of people. Yeah. Well, obviously, when we look back at um, 9-11 and and some of the, for example, TV shows and little bits of media that came before 9-11, it was the the, the whole idea of, of an exercise did seem to... Um, pop up from time to time, um, <clears throat> although not as much as in seven seven. Um, but as you say, um, between those two different different cases, um, that they are essentially different. Um, well, they, they were conducted completely differently. I mean, with with seven seven, for example, as you say, you've got a private consultancy doing a drill that actually has absolutely nothing to do with the real events at all, whereas in 9-11 you did actually have an agency who would, would have been concerned with that event directly, um, who were doing a drill, and yet in both instances um, the narrative, or the, at least the popular, shall we say, conspiracy narrative that people latch on to is that there were both exercises gone live. Now, it, as you say, it's f- for that reason. It's it's understandable to think that um, for people to think that um, seven seven was was just the same thing all over again. It was just another exercise gone live. Whereas, um, if you actually look um, at the evidence and the facts with seven seven, um, it doesn't fit. Now, why do you think it is then that that people have latched on to this idea of an exercise gone live in regard to seven seven? Uh, again, a lot of that comes down to timing. I feel because just uh, I mean seven seven happened just as people were starting to grasp 
this thing about the exercises on 9-11. If you remember the early years of, of the whole 9-11 thing, a lot of it was about uh, the no-plane theory, mm. and as is still the case, an awful lot of it was focused on what blew up the World Trade Center, what was used to blow up the World Trade Center. Um, the, the notion of the whole exercises and drills and, and tests and, and, and simulations and all of that came into the dialogue a little bit later on um, and in fact I don't think uh, Webster Tarpley who's particularly well known for advancing this whole exercise based theory I don't think he even really started talking about it until 2005-2006 so 7-7 happened in the middle of all that and so when people first saw I suppose the TV footage or first listened to the radio footage of Peter Power talking about this exercise that he was running on 7-7 um, it, it just kind of it all fell into place you know it's it's a paradigm thing that if that's what you're starting to understand 9-11 as and then suddenly there's this other extremely suspicious terrorist attack in London um, and there was also some kind of exercise being run in London based around bombings on tube trains or at tube stations um, it would seem to a I suppose to someone who is looking for an alternative explanation as though they found it um, and it all just sort of, if you like, coalesced together. It was synchronous. Um, that just as, if you like, just as the 9-11 investigators were looking for some kind of confirmation of this exercise theory, bang, 7-7 seven, seven happens, and hey, presto, there's an exercise involved in some way. Um, it's a circular argument, but of course, that's kind of how a lot of people think. That's how paradigms work, is through circular arguments where everything confirms everything else. Yeah. So, so that's that's one dimension to it. But the other dimension is is as we've been discussing um, through emails and, and before before we uh, we've done this podcast, there is this this big issue of predictive programming, mm -hmm. and that in the years between nine eleven and seven seven, you had a whole bunch of TV programs every last one of which involved the BBC, every last one of which was produced by the BBC, uh, that predicted these same memes over and over again came up in scenarios. So you had attacks on the underground or attacks on London train stations that came up loads. That in itself, not particularly surprising. You also have uh, Muslim suicide bombers. There's quite a lot of programs based around Muslim suicide bombers in London, including one film in 2004, which was a joint BBC-HBO production, a kind of joint British-American production, uh, this, this film called Dirty War, where two Muslim suicide bombers carry out a bombing at Liverpool Street tube station. So it predicted it to that degree. Um, you have all these different episodes of this show called Spooks, wherein you have Muslim suicide bombers. In fact, in the whole first season of that show, the only reference to suicide bombings is when a bunch of Muslim terrorists seize an embassy in London. They take some hostages and seize an embassy in London. And immediately the, the spooks, the heroes, start banging on about suicide bombers. Uh, in the second season, the only depiction of a suicide bombing is by a Muslim. In the third season, the only depiction of an attempted suicide bombing is by a Muslim. It's just, you know, over and over and over again, we were being fed these, these different relevant memes that predicted the attacks and, to a large extent, the official version of the attacks, but also, to a large extent, this popular alternative version, this exercise gone live theory that's all about Peter Power. Um, in as much as in the second season of Spooks, you have an episode where... Uh, they are doing an emergency response drill. They're doing an MI5 training exercise. It's all in, in office, but like they're, they're sort of locked in from the outside and they've all got to try and figure out a way of responding to this crisis. And then right in the middle of this exercise, it seems a real terrorist attack happens. So that is a, you know, the exercise gone live theory. Now, this episode broadcast uh, a couple of episodes after the Muslim suicide bomber episode but also uh, the date of the broadcast was the 7th of July 2003, yeah. exactly two years before 7-7. I'm not kind of saying I don't really know what to make of that. I'm just pointing it out because I think it's interesting. It is. And also in this 2004 film, Dirty War, uh, that's about Muslim suicide bombers, the film starts with a... 
big training exercise like the ones we saw in London in those years. Um, and it finishes with a terrorist attack that effectively replicates the scenario they were training for in the training exercise. So not quite the exercise gone live thing, but nonetheless, it's all playing around in the same kind of ballpark with the same kinds of theories where, you know, a, a simulation and a real event are somehow being mixed up and the, the lines become all blurry and somehow through that the violence happens. So, yeah, so the predictive programming with 7.7 didn't just predict the event, didn't just predict the official version, it also predicted at least some of the popular alternative versions. So when I found out in particular about all of this, I became even more sceptical about this, the relevance, if you like, of the Peter Power story and of, of the relevance of, of the exercise that he was running on the morning of 7-7. Yeah. Because that, that does seem to be one of the, at least one of the more popular um, <clears throat> narratives or alternative theories that has been advanced um, since 7-7 um, is that it was um, some kind of exercise gone live, something to do with MI5, yet at the same time somehow relating to this guy Peter Power, who, as you've mentioned to me before, um, for some reason turned up on the BBC on the day of the attacks and um, explained you know, to the audience, well, to, to the world, that he just happened to be um, simulating an exercise um, you know, that basically mirrored the actual event itself and then halfway through the, um, the, the simulation, it, he, he, I think he even used the words, it, it, it turned real, you know, and so... Yeah, he said we, uh, we had to suddenly switch the exercise from fictional to real. We, yeah, exactly, we had to suddenly switch the exercise from fictional to real. Now, this, as you, it as you mentioned before... It does sound suspicious. Yeah, it does, but this, this, um, this guy, Peter Power, had, he had nothing to do with, with actually dealing with a real exercise, did he? Um, you mean a real event? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. sorry, no, a real event. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Um, no, no. I, I mean, he was. He's an ex counterterrorism Met police officer mm. with a bit of a dodgy history, I must say. But there again, why is this somewhat dodgy guy going on TV on the very day of the attacks saying, I was running this exercise this morning? Um, but no, no, he, he had absolutely no responsibility except, I suppose, within that company that he was doing the little exercise for that morning. Um, had no responsibility for responding to this. Certainly not in terms of establishing culprits or uh, controlling the crime scenes or anything like that that would be important if you were going to somehow use this exercise to carry out a black bag false flag attack of some sort. Um, he, he didn't have any responsibility for any of that, and perhaps most crucially, him running that exercise didn't in any way enable him to have access to any of that. So it really just doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be anywhere near as important as the exercises on 9-11, and I think that parallel is a rather naive and simplistic one. Yeah, but it does, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it does, speak a lot to um to, to how effective the the art or the the science or the the process of predictive programming works because this this guy who ran a private consultancy who had absolutely no responsibility to actually partake um in any of the emergency management on the day of 7 7 was still there on the BBC on the day saying, oh, it went live, you know, we suddenly had to turn it to real world, even though he had actually, well, as far as we know, had no actual involvement in the in the sort of emergency response. Um, and as I understand it, he also popped up on, was it ITV the same day? And then was it another, was it in Canada shortly afterwards? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, it was BBC radio in the mid afternoon of 7-7. I don't know, four or five o'clock, something like that in the afternoon. He then appeared on ITV News, television news, um, at shortly after 8 p.m. in the evening, i.e. just as everyone's got home and is sat down and had their tea and then is watching the news to try and find out what the hell's happened. Um, and then two, three days later, he also turns up on Canadian television because he's over in Canada for some disaster management conference because that's what these management consultants spend their time travelling around doing. Um, 
and he's basically giving the same interview to Canadian television, saying, yeah, yeah, we were running this exercise, and it was the times and locations were virtually identical, all this sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, he he certainly did nothing to keep this quiet. If anything, yeah. he desperately wanted this out there, desperately wanted there to be interviews on, on both sides of the Atlantic so that people would know that he was running that exercise that morning. And certainly if he himself was somehow involved in perpetrating that crime, there is absolutely no reason that I can see for him to do that. No. It's only, only really if he suspected that he was somehow being set up that it would make sense for him to be desperately rushing out there and putting all this stuff out there. There is one other possible alternative, I suppose, and that is that he was a knowing... Uh, well, not a patsy as such, because he's not being blamed, officially blamed, for these attacks. But if you like an, a, uh, a pseudo-patsy for the alternative media, someone yeah. for them to throw their blame at and them, them to throw their focus on, um, that's a possibility that has occurred to me. It didn't occur to me straight away by any means. Um, that only really came to me later when I was reflecting on all of this and how the dialogue about 7-7 had panned out and started to realise just the extent of this predictive programming between 9-11 and 7-7. Um, it was only really then that I started to think, you know, maybe this guy hasn't got anything to do with the attacks in that sense. His, the whole purpose of him being there was in fact to, to create a red herring, was to create this you know, this other guy that we've got to worry about, this dodgy ex-copper that we now think is somehow involved in this attack. And so all of the energy and time and effort gets focused on him when, in fact, he's a nobody. He's just someone who was hired to do a job, if you like. That, that does seem to be the picture that emerges when you look at it from that angle, because, as you say, what we have is we have a few years um, leading up to 7-7 of fictionalized um, terror attacks in London, um, which established both an official narrative for you know Muslim suicide bombers and also a you know quote unquote conspiracy narrative for um, you know inside jobs and exercises gone live, and so people who have been watching that have have already been subconsciously prepared for those as as possible um, realities, and then what we have on the day of an, of, of an actual attack is some guy who turns up on television with the credentials and says, well, wow, you know, we were just doing this exercise and it turned live. And it's almost as if um, it's, it's, it's almost too perfect. It's almost telling the alternative media exactly what they want to hear and setting up a narrative for them to pursue, as you say, isn't it? Mm. Well, and providing them with the media to exploit in their documentaries and their radio broadcasts and their podcasts and everything else, you know, because yeah. it's not like he just... I don't know, posted this on his website or something, he seemed to be actively seeking out media opportunities to talk about this. Because um, I can't understand how, in the midst of all of the kind of uh, rushed, panicky coverage of 7-7, how he, they would have found the time to kind of squeeze him into their, their coverage and squeeze him into their schedule, unless he was really, you know, making the effort to try and get on the on the news and, and talk about this and get this message out there um, and there's i mean there's always the possibility that he was you know possibility that at least that he was waiting in the wings you know that he was part of his you know he his job his role you know whatever was was to come on and and give these interviews on that day um you know whether he knows why whether he can see the big picture how much he knows i mean that's all speculation but i mean it's distinct possibility that that's basically what his role was that day was to come on and give that narrative, knowing uh, well, at least the people who brought him on, you know, would know that this would be the red herring that the alternative media would follow and latch onto as the the narrative to pursue and the and the line of investigation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, every single different theory about Peter Power is speculative by yeah. its very nature. Yeah. But. Um, so to just kind of wrap this up and at risk of repeating myself, simply, I think there is far more evidence suggesting that that exercise was a deliberate diversion rather than a means of carrying out the attack. That is speculative and theoretical, but nonetheless, I think there is more evidence for that hypothesis than for the 
straightforward exercise gone live, Peter Power actually carried out 7-7 hypothesis. I do agree with that. I agree with that. I, I think that is more likely to be the case. I mm. think that is more likely to be the case. And um, well, it's not popular, but <laughs> that's, <laughs> uh, th that's the... That's that's the evidence doesn't, as you say. I mean, I, I haven't researched it nearly as thoroughly as you have, but the, the the evidence that's available does not fit an exercise gone live um, scenario, at least in terms of um, the Peter Power. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So well, we're going to talk about a lot of other things today as well, especially in regards to um, well, sort of in the same vein as we've been discussing the the connection between culture between media um pop culture and the, the the alternative culture as well the conspiracy culture um so to speak anyway um the the connections between those demographics and um <clears throat> the intelligence services and uh, the military industrial complex and we've been discussing um over the past few weeks a number of the recent films that have been very popular this year um such as uh, the recent bond film skyfall um, there was Batman, well, the, the Dark Knight Rises. Um, there was the Bourne Legacy, the, the fourth installation in that series. And there was also a very popular film released a few months ago um, called Zero Dark Thirty, which people may or may not be familiar with. Um, and that is, well, it's supposed to be the true story of the killing of Osama bin Laden. Um, Although the, the film itself is, it, it seems to be yet a third narrative from the, the narratives we've been given since the event itself. Because there was the initial narrative that the media came out with when it happened. Then there was the narrative that was put forth in a book written by one of the Navy SEALs who, on that mission. And then there was the narrative put forth in the film. And they're similar, but there are, um, there are definitely differences in there. So what was your take on Zero Dark Thirty? Well, just broadly speaking, I found it a deeply, deeply unpleasant film that seemed to have absolutely no care or consideration for historical accuracy whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to, to just polish off on our 7-7 our, our seven, seven, <clears throat> uh, chat, the, the bus bombing on 7-7 seven, seven, uh, was depicted in Zero Dark Thirty very expensively. They obviously actually got a bus and went to London and some of that looks like CGI. I think the explosion itself was expensive CGI. Yeah. Um, so you, they, they clearly went to quite a lot of production effort to reconstruct this bombing, this bus bombing, and yet they managed to get fundamental details about it wrong. For example, the route number on the front of the bus is wrong. They just got the number wrong. I mean, who, who knows anything about 7-7 and doesn't know that it's a number 30 bus that got blown up? That's just one of those details that's been repeated so many times that I would be very surprised if anyone could get that wrong. Uh, but more, even, perhaps even more fundamentally than that, when they depict the bus blowing up, the bus is moving. It's moving through Tavistock Square very, at yeah. quite a, a rate. It's, you know, just driving down the road at a kind of normal rate um, of driving, and then it blows up. And that isn't what happened. For one thing, they've got the explosion in the wrong place. And for another thing, the bus was either stationary or at least moving very, very slowly when the explosion did happen. Because all of the photographs afterwards establish quite, quite plainly and quite clearly to see that this bus hasn't really moved after the explosion happens. It's not like it came screeching to a halt or anything. It, it was either stationary or it was only moving very slowly. So this is just basic stuff that anyone with any, any desire to portray a realistic, truthful scenario would be able to find out and would be able to put in their film. And they, they just got it wrong. They clearly just didn't care whether or not it was accurate, it seems. Because I can't see any advantage to them in, in portraying it inaccurately. I think they, just, they were just apathetic, really. Mm. Um, they just said, well, this is what we want it to look like, and we don't care whether that's what really happened. So I think that gives you an impression of... The, the filmmakers kind of general approach to all of this that they weren't they weren't concerned with factual accuracy at all um they were concerned with the story they they felt they wanted to tell and that story was to keep to try and keep it simple that 
the CIA's torture program led them to the house in Abbottabad in Pakistan, and that's where they found Bin Laden. Yeah. Now, all of this is untrue. The CIA's torture program didn't lead them to that house in Abbottabad. Even the official CIA line on this is that that isn't true. Um, and the, <laughs> the whole question, did they find Bin Laden there? The film certainly adds nothing to that debate. No. Or at least that question. It provides no, no additional information, no additional evidence, no nothing that would make us any more certain that that was Bin Laden or, or even that it wasn't Bin Laden. Um, not that I would have thought they'd try and add, add fire to the debate that it wasn't Bin Laden. Um, but yeah, specifically, when they get to this house in Abbottabad, when they send in the Navy SEALs in their stealth helicopters... <laughs> one of which breaks down. One of which breaks down, yeah. yeah. Um, and there is a very... Uh, you, you saw the film recently, didn't you, that I one did. of the saddest moments in this whole film is when they have to blow up this downed yeah. helicopter, and that's when you like get the, the really point music and everything. Yeah. So sort of humanising the technology of the helicopter more than anything else, you know? Well, given that they've spent the previous half an hour running around this house shooting everything that moves, you just think, <laughs> who cares about the helicopter, yeah. really? In, in the grand scheme of things, it's a helicopter. Um, it's inanimate. It has no feelings. Anyway, the original story that they told of what happened on the top floor of this house is that... Bin Laden used one of the women up there, possibly one of his wives, as a human shield, and that he fired several shots at the Navy SEALs before they fired back and killed him. That was the story they put out pretty much straight away. We then, <clears throat> uh, shortly after September 11th last year, I think it was, we got a book published by one of the Navy, Navy SEALs who was apparently on this raid, and he said, no, 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 it didn't go like that. There was no human shield. There was no woman being used to protect Bin Laden or whoever that man was. That he didn't fire any shots. And that, in fact, one guy had got to the top of the stairs. And just as the guy who's writing the book, who's a few steps behind him, is kind of coming up the stairs behind him, uh, a few shots get fired. Um, oh, sorry, Bin Laden kind of ducks his head out of, from the room and the guy at the top of the stairs shoots at him. Uh, that's the second version we get. The version portrayed in Zero Dark Thirty is that there are several people at the top of the stairs and no one coming up the stairs. There is n no occurrence of this guy who's written this book. And that they're in fact sitting there for a little while and then one of them sort of whispers, Osama! Osama! And he sticks his head out of the room and they shoot him. So <laughs> these are three fundamentally different stories. You can't really reconcile the three together in any way. Um, and it just, again, it portrays this film as, as being far more concerned with myth-making and with telling a particular story that they wanted to tell than, than they were at all concerned with accuracy or sourcing information accurately or, or anything like that, which you'd think should be important to people who are making a film about a supposedly real-life event. Yeah. It's... But of course, that wasn't, that wasn't the aim of the film. It wasn't the aim of the film at all. No. I think I think that one of the most interesting things um, about the film, in light of everything you've just said, is the fact that it well, it was billed as being a, a an, well a, a historically accurate film. I mean, it, it was um, the the film directors and and script writers received um, sort of unprecedented, um, unequivocal cooperation from the the CIA and the Pentagon in making this film. And I think, um, if I'm correct, there were also supposedly granted to some of the secret archives, I think, at the CIA to gain access to some of the files on this mission or on Bin Laden. Um, so this was part of the, uh, I think it was at least part, in, in part of the sort of promotional material that, or, or, or some of the sort of the pre-film hype that went around was that, you know, this is, this is a true story. This is, this is actually what happened. This is a hard-hitting, almost like a docudrama about a real-life um, uh, sort of historic event. Um, that was made in, in cooperation with the CIA, CIA and the Pentagon, mm. and yet at the same time, as you say, it's, it, it betrays the, the most blatant historical inaccuracies. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's extraordinary, really, that given that they had this... this I, mean, I mean, what you can find, if you go on my website, my new website, which is spy, spyculture.com, mm. um, you can download the CIA and DOD emails relating to this film. Um, 
and basically what they show is that within a few weeks of this raid and it does seem that there was a raid in about about in Pakistan and they did actually go to that house in helicopters and shoot a bunch of people yeah I don't think that part of the story is untrue no uh, it seems there's abundant evidence for that because plenty of people in that town witnessed it witnessed it happening the question is who, who did, did they, they actually shoot? find there and why did they do that do all this um, neither question is answered by Zero Dark Thirty. But anyway, these emails basically show that within a few weeks of that happening in early May 2011, these filmmakers, Catherine Bigelow and Mark Boll, approached the CIA and the Department of Defense saying, we are planning to make a big Bin Laden raid movie. Can you give us help? And it seems that the response was, yes, absolutely. What would you like to know? Yeah. Not only if we can make certain agreements on secrecy and maintenance of classified sources and all of the usual kind of crap that you have to go through to get any kind of information about out of the security services whatsoever about anything. That's what a normal person like me, at best, that's the response I would get. Yeah. A couple of Hollywood filmmakers go there and it is, you know, come in, sit down, here's a cup of coffee and some biscuits. What would you like to see? What would you like to know? Would you like to see the room where we, where we planned all this? Yeah, come, come and have a look at it. It was the CIA basically just opened up the doors to them and and they engaged in this sort of massive mutual flattery session where they're, you know, the filmmakers are going, oh, this is so exciting to find out all of this stuff. And and God, oh, weren't you brave and weren't you intelligent to do all of this? And and the CIA guys are standing there going, yeah, yeah, but you're, you're really good. I really liked your previous film. I thought you I thought it was really good. And it seems like. There was just this, this remarkable degree of collusion between the two to the extent that this was, in effect, a CIA and Pentagon-sponsored movie. Not yeah. in a financial sense, but in a content sense, in a thematic sense. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's extraordinary that they managed to get so many things so dramatically wrong. And in particular, this issue of the torture does... I mean, I'm not quite sure what to make of it, because they had this... this masses of help from the CIA the CIA told them everything they could possibly want to know but what they don't appear to have told them is that the torture program the Guantanamo Bay black flights rendition all of that the CIA don't seem to have told them that this is what helped us find bin Laden the filmmakers seem to have come up with that on their own which is strange, and for what it's worth, since the film has come out and since there's been some criticism of it, even in the mainstream media, been some criticism of it for this, the CIA have said quite explicitly, this is wrong, this is historically inaccurate. So how did that happen? And one of the implications of it is that while the CIA are, <laughs> in the here and now, publicly denouncing that, they are probably privately quite happy about it. They're privately quite happy that this film glorified torture, even if they feel that in public they have to pay lip service to, no, 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 this is naughty, you can't portray torture like that in a film in such a heroic way. Um, so they're engaging in a kind of doublespeak about all of this, in as much as, you know, they sponsored this film, they well, sponsored it in terms of knowledge, in terms of information, and yet they're criticising it for not quite portraying the exact story they wanted to. It's funny because the, <clears throat> the, the whole concept of a um, cooperation between, say, uh, the, you know, a, a security or defence agency and the media is, is nothing new. I mean, this is, this is standard procedure when some Hollywood uh, director or producer wants to make a film that refers or includes uh, you know, an intelligence or military or something like that. Um, you know what they'll do is they'll speak to the the public liaison officer, and and usually what happens is the the military will actually come in and start you know saying right well if you if you want to use our tanks and our soldiers then we get to add in characters and change the script and um, do what we want in order to make our, in order to make sure the film represents us in the way that we want it to, and yet at the same time they seem to have completely missed the torture element in in this film you know considering they worked so closely together. Um, we're supposed to believe that um, Catherine Bigelow and Mark Boll went out and put torture in the film without the CIA actually knowing anything about it at all. You know, I think that's quite strange. But as you say, I'm sure they're quite pleased because it does normalize the concept and it familiarizes the public with the idea that <clears throat> the torture is, uh, you know, um, an acceptable practice in certain circumstances and that it does lead to 
um, quantifiable intelligence and um, you know the prevention of further further terrorists. So mm. it's funny that they they supposedly overlooked that though. You know, so it, it's, it's a very strange relationship that these filmmakers have had with the CIA. But as you say, I think it's more myth making than anything else. And I do think that, you know, whatever happened in regard to the torture issue, I think they're quite happy about it because that is the CIA's position. You know, they, we know that they do do it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that is their real position. They are pro torture. So therefore, whatever lip service they might pay to the anti torture criticism of this film in the here and now, I think we maybe take it with a pinch of salt really yeah yeah i think so now do you want to talk about skyfall skyfall we've been talking about skyfall as well that's another interesting one i've seen that a few times now actually it's it, it's a good watch it's quite fun isn't it it's a fun fun film to watch i also it's, find a, lot, it's a lot more fun than the constant waterboarding and degrading torture yeah. of zero dark 30 in any case yeah absolutely i mean that zero dark 30 was very depressing very dark um mm. I mean, we, we could go, we could even go further into that if you want to, but um, it would, I think we'd end up taking up the whole two hours um, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. it's yeah. But um, yeah, that that was interesting as well, Skyfall. Um, and I know that's another one that you did a review of on your spy culture site, and so mm. I would direct uh, listeners to go and have a look at that one too. But um, I, I enjoyed the film. I thought it was well done. It was well put together. I think um, the villain, the the antagonist, is is one of the best ones we've seen in a while. I found him really entertaining, um, quite a character. But um, mm-hmm. it's a different kind of Bond film than the ones we've seen before, isn't it? Because it it shows you the weakness of the hero, and it shows you a resurrection of some sort, much the same as we saw in The Dark Knight. Yeah, yeah, similar kind of thing. This sort of death and rebirth, death and resurrection, um, of the hero. But yeah, I mean, fundamentally what Skyfall seemed to be about to me was the humanization of the intelligence services of Sympathy, these, yeah. you know, faceless secret institutions. And like you say, to uh, to generate sympathy for them, to show them as vulnerable, to show them as under threat. You have this, the old James Bond, who, you know, he's getting, getting on in a, a bit, he can't shoot straight anymore and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and so we're very much we see these are heroes in this film as being directly involved in the jeopardy of the of the storyline normally it's not bond or m or or someone like that who is under threat it's some whatever some little country that someone's pointing a nuclear missile at or whatever it is that these the bad guys are planning to do whereas in this film it was specifically m and bond who were the targets of this rogue former agent genius hacker who's running around causing all this trouble and having all this fun um so it's 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 very much presented as a if you like a battle within the security service itself that you know the the enemy is actually the kind of the the jetsam of the security state he's an ex mi6 agent and there again that's about humanization or to my mind that's what it's about because if you like everyone beyond a certain age in life has a few skeletons in the closet everyone has a few things in their past they'd rather not talk about and rather not really get into because everyone makes the odd bad decision everyone does the odd stupid thing Um, so what you're portraying by having this rogue ex spook as the bad guy is that even MI6 has a few skeletons in the closet even MI6 can be embarrassed by its past so again it's about humanizing it it's about taking that institution that we know almost nothing about and portraying it as this sort of just the same as a a vulnerable person just trying to struggle their way through life and 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 make their way through life and so the whole thing and i think it was extremely successful in this because the film has been both commercially and critically very successful uh it was about generating sympathy for the security services at a time when all of this stuff, for example, about extraordinary rendition is now coming out and we're now realizing, you know, our, our kind of worst suspicions about what they were up to in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 have all been proven true, uh, pretty much every last one of them. So one of the ways you can counter that criticism or criticism of the drone program, for example, one of the ways you can counter that is by portraying the security services as the a sort of a friend in need as someone who as a thing that needs to be sympathized with um 
not only sympathized with, but something that's absolutely necessary as well. Um, because I think you might recall in the there's, there's a scene in the film where the villain is um, broken out of custody in MI6 and he's running about uh, London um, making a mess, basically, and with mm-hmm. Bond in pursuit. Uh, meanwhile, M is at the Intelligence and Security Council hearing, um, and she's talking about um, the you know the recent um, the leaks and uh, the the controversy over this this villain and the bombing of MI six. And she's basically being grilled by um, <clears throat> being Somebody, grilled. It, it, yeah, okay. yeah, and um, she go, she goes on this big big sort of um, spiel about um, how. I mean, I, I, I can't remember exactly what she says, but she she basically says that um, she, she sort of gives you the impression that, look, you know, you, you little people don't know what the hell you're talking about. We live in a dangerous, dangerous world. And by God, you better be thankful that we're here to protect you because I'm scared and you should be too. And so you, she, she's creating, you know, within the film Skyfall, you've not only got sympathy for the, the agencies and the agents, but um, you, you've been given the distinct impression that, they're absolutely necessary and that we'd all be dead without them as well yeah sure sure and this this connects back very much with zero dark 30 which of course begins with an audio montage from 9 11. that's right and yeah. then goes then goes straight into the torture sequences it's yeah. not subtle yeah. it's not subtle at all yeah. um there is another dimension actually to this uh, to skyfall and in particular this character of the the rogue x agent the rogue x spook and typically they do they are a hacker this is a relatively frequent character in in spy movies and spy tv series um and the particular aspect to that aside from the psychological dimension of humanization and sympathy is the political uh implication of this and that is what's called blowback this notion that an operation can go bad and someone who was an asset can go rogue and go off and do something terrible and it's all accidental and the security service is never intended for this to happen even if they were involved with this person in the past for example we have the whole al-qaeda mujahideen in afghanistan thing where it's now widely admitted the cia the department of defense mi6 whoever else sponsored the mujahideen in afghanistan throughout the 1980s whipped up radical Islam, facilitated it, trained people, armed them, equipped them, gave it money, all the rest. Um, so they, if you like, generated this international Islamist phenomenon that we're now supposed to be so scared of, and that yeah. is now supposedly our enemy. And even Hillary Clinton has openly kind of adva- advanced and advocated this narrative of blowback that you know, this is just something that got out of control. It got out of hand. We never intended for Al Qaeda to sort of come back and bite us in the ass. It yeah. just happened that way. Yeah. Now, all of that's you know, it's nonsense. It's not a true narrative, no. not at all. Well, I mean, they told them at the time, "This is a holy war you're fighting." That's what they said to the Mujahideen. They were training them, saying, "Yours is a holy war." Mm. Mm. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> unintended blowback. You know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so this kind of narrative of the rogue X spook in a, in a film like Skyfall or in a show like Spooks, because there's quite a few of these characters in Spooks as well, um, very much fits in with that blowback narrative and very much reinforces that and makes people think, oh, they would never deliberately do this. It's just it sometimes happens that way because, you know, they're working in a dirty, dangerous world and, and just this is what sometimes has to happen. Yeah, that's right. It's too complicated for us peasantry. To, to understand, you know, mm. <clears throat> but yeah, so Skyfall was, I think there's probably the main, the main two elements which, which spoke to me or which were most pronounced to me in, in Skyfall was, as you say, this sympathy for the intelligence services and, and of course the, the agents themselves. Um, and whilst also portraying them as being absolutely necessary. Um, and the, you know, there's, there's always the, the sort of the typical sort of recruitment aspect to it as well, whether it's cool, it's sexy, all the characters are very slick, they're, they're constantly delivering these one-liners to each other and trying to sort of outdo each other on the um, on the slick factor, you know, mm, um, mm. especially with the new Q, you know, the new Q Yeah, young, young Q, young, young cool Q hacker, Q. very cool, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I, I guess it's, it's quite similar to a, to a lot of uh, films about intelligence agencies. But as you say, 
uh, very poignant at this particular time. Now, what else? There was some other. Have you seen Argo yet? I haven't seen Argo yet. No, I'm afraid. So we we, we might have to leave that one we'll for another conversation. One for the next time. I mean, to, to be honest, it's it's not too deep, but it is worth seeing because it, it, again, it's advancing um, a narrative, a, 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 a certain narrative, and a lot of emotions as well that are very poignant and kind of tie into Zero Dark Thirty as well. But um, you have seen the Bourne legacy, which I've also seen, and I also found very interesting. Now, mm. there's a, there's a lot in that film. There's a lot in it, um, and it, I, I, I've seen it a number of times now, and I, I get something new out of it uh, every time I watch it. But, um, but what I mean, maybe you would like to lead off here. What 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 do you think really spoke to you in, in the Bourne legacy? Well, I mean, all all sorts of things, as you say. It's, it's a very multifaceted film, but I, I suppose the thing that that struck me in the way that the story panned out at the end of the film, after you've had this, you, you've got this whatever super soldier, this genetically modified, genetically enhanced super soldier, running around, and the program that is supposed to be running him has decided to shut it shut it all down. So they're hunting all these guys down and killing them. Um, and he's the only one that's left. And he is trying, he finds out that um, that he's been genetically modified, basically. You see him taking these pills throughout the whole film, these chems, they call them. Yeah. Um, and in particular, they are, they're blues and greens. And I yeah. found that interesting because blues is actually a uh, street name, if you like, for certain a certain type of drug. That's if right. you don't know which which one, you can look it up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, I don't know whether they, that's deliberate. But anyway, it amused me slightly when I was watching the film. The way the film sort of pans out, he he finds out that he's had the kind of physical genetic upgrade to his body has been kind of hardwired into him through a virus, but that the mental upgrade the mental enhancement is still only temporary and that he's dependent on continually taking these pills in order to keep his super intelligence and his sort of super reactions and what have you um so the way the film pans out he and this young white female chemist uh there's a lot of young white women in these films yeah um that's a very very common character they like to build in it's pretty mandatory i think you know the guy yeah, has to get a girl at the end you know mm. um the way it pans out, they run off to the Philippines where the, whatever the viruses are being manufactured with the idea that she's, this, this doctor is going to create this virus that's going to permanently enhance his intellectual capacities. So the person we're rooting for in the film is someone who is willfully trying to pursue a kind of superhuman, transhuman upgrade. That's right. That's what we're ultimately sympathising with. Yep. Aside from any question about which side you're on, because you've got the sort of CIA and the Pentagon on one side and this mysterious organisation sort of sitting and bridging above all this, um, and they're the ones trying to sort of hunt them down and what have you. So you could say this is a slightly anti-security state sort of film in as much as the bad guys are portrayed as the security state. Mm. But, but the story we're being given in terms of heroism in terms of something to identify with is basically transhumanism that's is, right you know sticking a virus in your arm because you want to be smarter yeah it's it's a it's a funny um it's a funny dynamic there isn't it because they've as you say on, on one hand they are um portraying the security services and the military establishment as the antagonist but it's almost as if they're saying well the solution to to, to break free of that or to oppose that is to upgrade yourself through science and through the, the sort of the transhuman slash eugenics um option you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's it's you've got yeah it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword you've got um i don't know whether you want to call that sort of fake rebellion or it, it sort of fits in that along that lines in some way because it's um they're sort of giving you the problem and the solution in, in one go. And really the solution isn't actually a true solution. It's it's directing you back towards the same agendas that those very same agencies have. Because we know that all of yeah, these of course, drugs... It's, 
it's just another form of control. It's, a yeah. it's presented as radical and revolutionary, but it's just another form of control. Exactly. The, the, the solution is to do this when, in fact, it's just another form of control because we do know that these technologies and these drugs are in, being developed by the very same agencies that this, they're trying to rebel from. So mm. it's like trying to fight the enemy with the tools that they've given you. So. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And then, um, I don't know, I mean, that's it's a similar kind thing. of thing, to be honest, with, the, um, with the, the, the recent Batman film, with The Dark Knight Rises, in that that, our hero, in as much as he's remotely heroic, which isn't very much, uh, is this sort of egotistical, bored billionaire who, you know, just doesn't seem to be up to much with his life. And then conveniently, a bunch of terrorists turn up for him to, to him to fight with. But what is Batman? Batman is another enhanced human. He's a yeah. super soldier. He has this sort of transhuman half-robot suit that makes him stronger and quicker and means he can jump off buildings and all the rest of it. And even in the most recent one, he has yeah. a drone aircraft. And Our and the hero most, has a drone. Uh, in the most recent one, they also give him an exoskeleton leg because of his busted knee, which they yeah. hadn't actually brought out in the previous one. So there's a, this is far more direct in the most recent one. They actually show you with him having physical augmentation on his body and making him stronger. And, and necessarily so in order for him to go out and, and combat these terrorists. Exactly, yeah. So it's the same kind of dynamic that, you know, wherever this threat is coming from, whatever the danger is, the solution is to kind of either stick robots into your arm or, or inject a virus or put on a robot suit or or whatever it is but that's sort of that's presented as the heroism and as the solution and i just i don't know i i found the, the most recent batman film almost unwatchable um i really really didn't enjoy it at all and not just because it had those kind of values and that kind of subtext i just i also thought it was just a really really bad movie yeah well, each their own. I thought it was all right. I thought it was at least watchable on a kind of a junky level, you know. Sort of, you don't have to think about it too much. But I think one of the most interesting things that they brought out in the most recent Batman film was this kind of blurring the lines between between causes and morality and good and evil, and the, the usual um, the the distinction between um, sort of protagonist and antagonist and their values is usually much more pronounced in other films whereas in this one what you've got is this terrorist guy Bane um, who wants to cause a revolution and basically destroy this big towering city of Gotham um, by giving it back to the people and so what, you, what you've got there is the idea of um, dethroning the establishment you've got the idea of uh, giving the, the average person some power over their own lives and their own system Mm -hmm. um, and so you've got a, a, you know, you've got some some genuine, sort of legitimate concerns and themes there, which a lot of people will are able to be will be able to relate to at this particular time. Um, you know, the idea of ending corruption and, and putting the power back in the people's hands. But at the same time, those particular uh, themes are being equated with terrorism. And in the Batman film, the only, what Batman is doing is. I mean, he's not looking to make things any better for the average person or to actually um, try and push for any more equality or, or, or social justice in Gotham. All he's doing is using his, you know, billions of pounds to restore the status quo. And that's what we're being presented with as the hero. So, and, well, and that's that the struggle of the future. The struggle is between people on the one hand who believe in social justice who believe in people having some rights in their own life and some power over their own life and on the other hand a bunch of billionaires who, who just kind of want to kick the crap out of us yeah um, and yet in this case so, it's presented as being the hero <laughs> yeah yeah um but i i suppose what i'm uh, what am i driving at here what i'm driving at is that it's not just about the protagonist antagonist you laid that out perfectly you're absolutely right about that but it's also about saying to those people who think, you know, the, the Occupy movement, the modern day anarchists, whatever, uh, I suppose on the other heart, side of the political spectrum, you have the libertarians and the anarcho-capitalists and all of that lot. It's basically saying to all of them, uh, it's not just sort of demonizing all of that through uh, associating it with this horrible terrorist, but it's also kind of saying to them, if you really believe all this, then you should become a terrorist. You should yeah. embrace the violent overthrow of the status quo and that somehow that's 
you know, that's your trajectory, that's your future. Um, Because that's the future that's been portrayed and depicted for you in in this incredibly expensive, incredibly well-promoted Hollywood film. So you either, I suppose, the the radical, the person who does believe in this, is faced with two choices, really. They're either faced with the reaction of, oh, these these terrorists are bad, Maybe, maybe I'm on the wrong track here, maybe I'm not believing the right things, I'm not thinking the right things. Or they're faced with people who believe this need to take violent action in order to to manifest their beliefs in the real world and either one of those choices again is just another form of control it's just another trap for you to fall into that's right it's another dialectic yeah which people mm-hmm. fall into all too readily especially in in when it's being presented in such a dramatic way as it is in these films and, and obviously batman is not the only one to do this but it's the most recent and the most obvious that i can think of anyway well, and like Skyfall, it was enormously successful. So it's yeah. important. Yeah. So there was another film that came out in, I think, was it 2010, Source Code? Or was it 2011? I think it was 2010, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, it was an interesting yeah. one, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that seems to be a, an advert for DARPA's Total Information Awareness Programme to me mm. you remember this the, the tia yeah. program with yep. the <laughs> horrifically sort of weird occult symbolism well, in the, the logo, in the logo yeah. <laughs> for it, with all the you know eye of horus and all of that yeah um and uh darpa the whatever it is defense Ad- advanced research and projects agency or something like that that's I remember it, exactly yeah. what DARPA stands for um and this is essentially the pentagon's advanced technology unit i suppose something like that um and the whole point in source code is that you've got this dead soldier whose mind is being injected through computers through quantum mechanics it seems into the last eight minutes of the memory of another dead guy who has died in a terrorist attack Uh um and predictably this isn't explained with any kind of (laughs) rational or, or detailed explanation it's just sort of thrown out there with phrases like parabolic calculus and you're just expected to kind of gloss over that and assume yeah. that it's all possible just throw in the word quantum every five every every other sentence and people will buy it you know yeah yeah exactly um but the point of this is not whether or not this is actually possible i don't think it's predictive programming in that sense no. that they're actually going to ultimately be trying to do this it's more the message is i suppose uh if you're a terrorist, we will find you. And it yeah. doesn't matter if we have to use quantum mechanics to inject the brain of a dead soldier into another dead person's brain for the last eight minutes of their memory. We will find you. We will yeah. do that and, and we'll track you down. Um, and just this notion, I suppose, of there being no escape. So again, for, for the radicals out there, for the rebels out there, anyone who might be I'm not in any way advocating terrorism, advocating violence, but for any of them out there, they'll be watching this film and thinking, you know, Christ, they they, they can do almost anything to find me. Um, so there's no point, because sooner or later, they will get me. Um, there was also the other sort of worrying aspect to this that sort of fits in with the transhuman thing that we are just talking about. Yeah. Is that right at the end of the movie, our hero, Jake Gyllenhaal, uh... <laughs> He is injected into this guy's memory one last time because it's done, you know, he's, he lives through those eight minutes several times throughout the course of the film. Mm. And he's injected in there one last time. And in his version of the reality where he's dead, uh, the machine's turned off and he dies. But in the version of the reality that he's been kind of put into, he survives and he takes over this guy's life. Yeah. And that's supposed to be the kind of the happy ending that's the happy ending yeah he um he gets you're dead but you can be injected into someone else's brain in another dimension and therefore continue living yeah i mean we could go into the sort of esoteric uh interpretations and (laughs) of all that stuff but that that would be another interview but yeah that's um that was the happy ending you know the fact that he avoided he was injected into this guy's brain he managed to save this guy from being killed and somehow through some 
anomaly or some rule they didn't uh, didn't quite understand the magic um, of hollywood basically yeah, yeah the magic of, th through the magic of hollywood he um because he managed to save this guy's life um he, he basically inhabited his mind forever and he took on an entirely new identity and somehow even though everybody else saw him as the person who he had infiltrated he saw himself or he's, supp he's still supposed to be himself somehow with the same face so i mean again the magic of hollywood but the message is quite clear you know that this is a a good thing this is uh this you know you can win with this you know you can mm. the, the good guy wins the technology has saved him it's given him his life back he saved the day and he's got the girl and he walks off into the sunset all thanks to the military industrial complex absolutely absolutely yeah there was another um just just to mention just for people who might want to consider this there's another angle that i sort of took on that which was that um i could be wrong here but I, th this this film source code deals with um you know a, a a big terrorist bomb going off on a train and it seemed to come out at the exact same time as there was a lot of controversy in the states about the the transportation safety authority um moving onto trains Mm -hmm. uh, they had said that they wanted to start setting up the uh, whatever it was checkpoints and and body scanners and stuff at, at train stations and there was a lot of obvious resistance to this and it seemed that to be at just around the time that there was this resistance we had a, a hollywood film come out about terrorism on the trains so it's almost legitimizing the fact that we need you know um intelligence slash security slash high technology uh, on the train system so you know that's just an observation, but it's something that people consider because the um, the timing was was very interesting. Yeah, I think you're right in that observation. I think it it is very much playing into that that dialogue and that uh, rejection of the TSA's attempts to securitize all transport. Um, and that yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it's bad enough that well, I mean, it's terrible that they do the things to people in airports that they do to them. The notion that you should expand this to just traveling through a city on a train is is absurd and horrible and yet it's very much encouraged and and enhanced by by that film yep well i think we're coming up to the end of our first hour here so what we'll do is we'll take a brief break and then we, we shall return and talk more about these things and others in hour two <laughs> 